Midnight, March 27th, 2014. Amanda lays in bed, her eyes wide open, glued to the black TV screen in the corner of the room. Unable to sleep, her head bursts with a migraine headache as soreness pulses down the back of her neck. Suddenly, the TV, despite being turned off and unplugged, begins to speak to her. Terrified, she leaps out of bed, reaches for the light switch, and turns on the lights. The voices now shift, emanating instead from the light bulb. But there's no one there. She grips her forehead and shrieks, falling to the ground, rolling around and clutching her head. What? the hell is going on. In the coming weeks, as her condition gets worse, her memory of these episodes deteriorates, almost as if she's not there. She's diagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenic, but medication does nothing for her. She begins behaving like someone on LSD, PCP, or bath salts, despite never touching any hard drugs in her life. So she's admitted to the psych ward, where she quickly deteriorates, becoming belligerent and uncontrollable. She screams that she doesn't belong there and attempts to climb out the window. When her parents arrive for a visit, she doesn't even recognize them. Almost as if she's been taken over by a dark, malevolent force. Her vital signs begin to plummet, and eventually, she falls into a coma. Had Amanda been born just a few decades prior, her outlook would have been bleak. The church would likely have deemed her possessed by demons, and priests would have been called in for an exorcism. But Amanda was lucky, and during her coma, a medical test revealed the actual cause of her symptoms. Anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, an autoimmune condition where her body's own antibodies attack the NMDA receptors in the brain, which are critical for memory and synaptic communication. This autoimmune response led to hallucinations hallucinations, psychosis, seizures, memory loss, and erratic behavior. And though the condition may appear supernatural, it's entirely treatable if caught in time. And fortunately for Amanda, her case was. And after Dr. Eric Lancaster administered cytoxin and rituximab, she made a complete recovery and now lives a normal life. I recall that she responded very rapidly to the infusion of these second line agents and woke up from her coma within several days of that being started. The year is 944, and a small town in the Aquitaine region of France is gripped by fear. A mass psychosis has begun spreading through the village. First, people begin shaking uncontrollably. Some have seizures. Others claim to see terrifying visions. A few villagers even describe feeling like their bodies are burning from the inside out. As their condition deteriorates, their limbs begin to turn red, and then black as their flesh rots away. Clearly, there's something evil and otherworldly that's working its way through them. Local priests definitively declare it to be the work of demons and witchcraft, a curse that's fallen upon the community. They cry out to St. Anthony to deliver the desperate villagers from these dark forces, and most of the people who they pray for eventually do recover. Hallelujah, it's a miracle. And yet, despite countless prayers and attempts to cast the devils out of the village, as many as 20% deteriorate and fall prey to the darkness. When all is said and done, tens of thousands lie dead. But unbeknownst to the villagers, despite the apparent effectiveness of prayer, if you can call 80% effective, the cause was not supernatural. Instead, the local rye bread that they'd been eating was contaminated with a fungus called ergot. This fungus produces toxic compounds which affect the nervous system, interacting with serotonin and dopamine receptors in the brain, leading to erratic behaviors and terrifying visions. Ergotism, also known as St. Anthony's Fire, causes hallucinations and muscle spasms, and while most people eventually do recover, in severe cases it can cause gangrene, which, if left untreated, can be deadly. Outbreaks like this one fueled tales of demonic possession or even witchcraft throughout medieval Europe, and may have also been responsible for the symptoms reported during the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. Fortunately, ergotism is rare today due to strict regulation and modern farming practices that thoroughly inspect cereal grains for ergot contamination. However, it was once a major issue, particularly in areas where rye was a stable crop, and it was scientific advances, not spiritual warfare, that led to a widespread decline of this seemingly demonic condition. Next, we turn to the odd case of John, who was never religious. Having never been baptized or dedicated his life to God, many Christians might think that he'd be a prime target for demonic attack. It's nighttime, and John goes out camping with his girlfriend, and they start drinking heavily, heavier than he's used to. Suddenly, he falls on the ground, convulsing and foaming at the mouth, one seizure after another, eight in total that night alone. Between epileptic episodes, he laughs in ecstasy one minute, and then cries in agony the next, describing vivid visions of heaven and hell, which bring tears to his eyes. And when the seizures eventually stop, he has the profound feeling that he himself 
is God. After that night, his seizures and visions continue, and he begins behaving entirely out of character, running through the streets shouting, I'm God! His neighbors look on in shock as he pelvic thrusts in front of them, stating with absolute confidence, You want to effing bet? I ain't God. Everything around him feels as though it's been imbued with deep significance. <laughs> Even simply experiencing the world around him is now unbearably intense. Had John's case been presented to the church, his visions, seizures, blasphemy, and out-of-character behavior would quite possibly have been attributed to the forces of Satan. But an investigation by the neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran revealed that he actually had temporal lobe epilepsy. John's epileptic seizures are essentially an electrical storm in his temporal lobes when a group of neurons start firing at random, out of sync with the rest of his brain. This type of epilepsy originates in the temporal lobes, which are involved in processing emotions, memories, and sensory input. Abnormal electrical discharges in this region can cause vivid hallucinations, extreme emotional outbursts, and even sensations of deja vu or fear. What seems like possession is actually the brain misfiring in very specific areas, creating distorted perceptions of reality. In some cases, the electrical storm in the temporal lobe can be so mild that the person can experience visions and have deeply religious experiences without ever experiencing the convulsions or other symptoms usually associated with seizures. People might have a religious experience without even realizing that they just had a seizure. Many historians believe that this was the case with Joan of Arc, who led the French army to victory against the English after having visions of heaven. Be before she was captured, given a politically motivated sham trial, and burned alive at the stake for heresy, witchcraft, and cross-dressing, aka wearing men's armor into battle. Now we turn to a medieval Scottish village. Lightning tears across the sky as the villagers huddle together in the local church to celebrate mass on St. Andrew's Eve. Eli, the Thatcher's son, sits quietly in the corner of the room, fidgeting as the priest recites from the prayer book. As they stand up to receive communion, without warning, the boy lurches forward and almost falls. His body begins jerking violently, arms and legs flailing erratically, almost as if he's dancing, entirely involuntarily. He seems to growl something nonsensical and then laughs uncontrollably. His father smacks the back of his head, scolding the boy, but as if possessed by an external force, the child is unable to stop. Feeling the surrounding pressure, he breaks into tears, crying hysterically. They shuffle to the front of the church, but when given the communion bread, the boy's tongue lurches out of his mouth, rejecting the sacred sacrament, spitting it on the ground. The parishioners gasp, crossing themselves as they murmur that the child has been possessed by a demon. The priest rushes forward and hands the child a crucifix to see how he'll react, but the boy's hand seems to reject the cross with a jerking motion, dropping it to the ground beside the communion bread. After two hours of exorcism and continuous twitching, the child finally collapses in exhaustion, asleep but seemingly freed of demonic spiritual influence. That is, until he wakes the next morning and the symptoms resume. For the next six months, the exorcisms continue, until finally the erratic behavior subsides and the church declares the exorcisms a success. The child's soul has been saved. But in actuality, this is a case of Sydenham's chorea, also known as St. Vitus Dance, a condition linked to rheumatic fever, a delayed autoimmune response to an untreated or poorly treated group A strep infection. It occurred when antibodies produced by the child's body to fight the strep infection instead mistakenly attacked his basal ganglia, a region of the brain which controls movement and emotional regulation. Reflexes are diminished, and the resulting jerking movements, often described as dancing, coupled with the sudden uncontrollable emotional outbursts, make it easy to see why people believe believed that supernatural forces were at play. The boy's body wasn't rejecting the communion or the cross, as it may have seemed. His body was simply twitching and jerking uncontrollably. Furthermore, symptoms of this condition are notably absent during sleep, so you can see why church leaders might think that the exorcism was working when the child passed out in exhaustion and suddenly stopped twitching or moving sporadically. But despite the religious take on the situation, this condition is simply an autoimmune response gone awry. It usually goes away way on its own, but without modern medical treatments, symptoms can last up to a year or more, and the entire time there's difficulty eating, drinking, and swallowing, risk of choking, and in the worst cases, the condition can reappear. And if the underlying rheumatic fever is not addressed, that can lead to inflammation of the heart and potentially death. 
A scrawny old woman wanders the streets of an Italian farming village, disheveled and muttering about how she's already dead. Her eyes sunken in, malnourished. Her appearance looks as though death, indeed, is not far off. She refuses food, claiming that it won't help because her body is decaying from the inside. And she avoids the church because religion, after all, is for the living. Neighbors avoid her, convinced that she's under the influence of a demon or a curse. And when famine strikes and the local crop yield fails, all fingers point to this neurotic undead witch. But in actuality, she has a case of Cotter's delusion, also known as walking corpse syndrome. It's a rare condition where individuals believe they're dead, don't exist, or are decomposing. The condition can have multiple causes, but is associated with dysfunction in the frontal and parietal lobes of the brain, which are responsible for self-awareness and body perception. When these areas are disrupted, the brain fails to integrate sensory information, leading to the horrifying belief that one's own body is lifeless. Depending on the underlying cause, with luck, medication and psychotherapy can help treat the condition. But this woman isn't lucky. In order to determine if she's a witch, she's tied up and thrown into a river to see if she floats. She doesn't. So the villagers conclude that she must have been innocent now that she's drowned. Now these are just five medical conditions which have throughout history been indeed mistaken for demonic possession or supernatural occurrences. This is part of a multi-part series. If you haven't seen my previous videos about demon possession cringe fails, I'll link to those below. Also, smash that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you make sure that you don't miss the next videos in this series. Are there any conditions that I missed that I should know about? Please comment them in the description below. And if you appreciate this video and you want to support my work, you can make a per video pledge on Patreon.com com slash holy kool-aid or a one-time donation on paypal thank you guys so much for your ongoing support smash that like button on the way out and as always dare to be curious but don't drink the kool-aid